Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Neo4j stream. My name is Will. I see Uday in the chat from Australia. Great. Thanks for joining. Uh, cool. So today we are picking up from where we left off last time in our book club series. So we've been working through the chapters of the full stack GraphQL applications with grand stack book. Um, specifically, we, we've been working with this ebook version, which is an excerpt of three chapters. Um, we're using this one because it is free for anyone to download. Uh, I'll drop the link in the chat here. So anyone can download this. You get a PDF version. Not sure if there's an EPUB version, at least a PDF version of three chapters of the Manning book, Full Stack GraphQL. Uh, and so that's what we've been working through. So chapter one was looking at what is the grand stack? What are the components? How do they fit together? Uh, chapter two, we skip in this excerpt, but that's okay because uh, in the stream last time we combined it with Chapter three, so chapter two looks at how do we use Apollo server to build GraphQL APIs. Chapter two uses just kind of like fake hard-coded data. Um, but in the stream last time, we combined that concept of building GraphQL APIs with Apollo server. We combined that with the idea of how we use the JavaScript client drivers and Cypher in Neo4j to build um, I guess we can call it a naive implementation of a GraphQL API. And we'll talk a bit about why it's naive and, and how we can improve that today. But basically that's what we did last time, showing how we can use Neo4j, Cypher, the JavaScript driver for Neo4j, and Apollo server to build a GraphQL API. So that's what we did last time. Today, we are going to jump into chapter four uh, chapter four, this is, I think, my favorite chapter so far in the book, because in this one, we're jumping into the Neo4j GraphQL integrations uh, that are really powerful, that show us uh, how we can build GraphQL APIs backed by Neo4j, writing as little boilerplate code as is necessary. So we'll talk about what features the Neo4j GraphQL integrations have, um, why we can use them, and then we'll take a look at how we can use them to build GraphQL APIs, including adding custom logic, which is really important. Okay, so Diago says hi from Canada. Great, thanks for joining. Cool. Okay, so let's just Go ahead and jump in. Um, let's switch to VS Code. So here's where we left off last time. Uh, so we have this database in Neo4j. Here it is. Let's fire this up in browser so we can just take a look at the data model. So we'll say call db.schema.visualization. This will show us the data model. So we've got users that have written reviews. Reviews are connected to businesses and businesses belong in a category. So I can say, for example, show me the coffee category. Okay, I've got two coffee businesses. Uh, what other categories? Are they in? Are there overlapping categories? Uh, what reviews have been written? And what users have written those reviews? And what other businesses have those users reviewed? And so on. So that's the data set we have that we're working with. Same one we were working with last time. Uh, and in the book, this is the data set we use throughout the book. You can access it by running colon play grand stack in the uh, in the FJ browser and it gives you this interactive guide 
so this query you can click on to run this query, which will load some data from this CSV file. So that's the data set we're working with. Um, and if you want to run that and load it, just run colon play grand stack. Okay, so back to our code here. So we were using, let's make this a bit bigger. There we go. So we're using uh, the New York J JavaScript driver. So we pulled that in. We're also using Apollo server and this GQL template tag. So the first thing we, we did was create a driver instance to connect to Neo4j. In this case, this is my local database. So this is the default connection string when I'm running my database locally. And then uh, username and password that I set when I created the database. Then we define our GraphQL type definitions and we wrap these in the GQL template tag. The reason we do that is uh, the GQL tag can basically parse this uh, into an AST, uh, but it also gives us the benefit of syntax highlighting in, uh, in VS Code, which is nice. So we created these type definitions. Did we do this in the first chapter, I think, maybe? Or maybe we did it last time. But basically, we started with a graph model. And let's see if we. Do we still have that graph model loaded? Let's see if we can find that. I think so. Yeah, so this is using the arrows tool. Here it is. So this is a diagramming tool called arrows, which I like to use for starting off uh, any graph data modeling project. So we went from our business, our sort of written business requirements, which are we're going to build this business reviews, web application. We want to be able to search for businesses by category. We want to write a review. We want to see personalized recommendations, those sorts of things. So we, we created the graph data model based on those business requirements. And then we converted those, or converted that graph data model to GraphQL type definitions. Uh, that shows what entities are we interested in? What fields do they have? Uh, and then importantly, how are those entities connected? So here a business is connected to category nodes. That's where the graph part of GraphQL comes in. We've described a data graph here that we can traverse from businesses to categories, to other businesses, to reviews, to users, and so on. Now we have a special type in GraphQL called the query type. This is uh, the one of the entry points for the API. We also have mutations and subscriptions, uh, which, which we didn't get into last time. But uh, the query type, in this case, is the entry point. So we start at business search or current user. Uh, we implemented then the resolvers. So this is where the logic lives for actually fetching this data. So the resolvers are responsible for resolving this data from, uh, from the data layer. In this case, that means querying our NeoFJ database. So we wrote a Cypher query to match businesses uh, that contain some search string. And then there's a bit of boilerplate here to create a session for the driver to, to make the query. We have to pull the result out that we're interested in, uh, massage that a little bit to the format that's expected for Apollo server. Uh, and then we had to, then had to do the same. Now, basically, for every uh, sort of nested resolver. So in this case, business search gives us a list of businesses. But then if we want to say grab the categories for a business, so if we look at the business type here, so the business type, um, well, it has, it has these uh, scalar field resolvers. So like 
business ID, name, address. Okay, so those, those will come back in our first database query. We can just use the default resolvers. So in GraphQL, the default resolvers, oops, control Z that. Uh, the default resolvers are basically just looking up uh, by key in the object that comes back from the previous resolver. So with business search, we return this JavaScript object from the database here which is the business node. So it's gonna have the name, address, location, business ID, that sort of thing. So that's fine. We don't have to implement those. That's just like fetching, uh, fetching an entry in the business object that comes back from Neo4j. But for these, re these reviews and categories fields, so the object fields, these are object list fields, uh, that we need to make then a separate request to the database to find the categories. So we had to start implementing the categories resolver. So here we say, okay, we know what business we've resolved so far. Let's traverse out to the category and return those categories. Again, sort of massaging that, that result data that comes back from the F4J into the format that Apollo server expects. Um, so let's, let's run this. Oh, right. And then, so that's our resolvers. Um, and then we create an Apollo server instance by passing in the type definitions and resolvers. So Apollo server basically can mash together our type definitions and resolvers and create what's called a GraphQL executable schema. Uh, and then Apollo server does two things. One, it handles the networking requests. So it handles incoming GraphQL requests, uh, and then it can execute those against our executable schema. The other thing we need to pass to uh, the uh, constructor here where we're instantiating an Apollo server instance is uh, we need to inject this NeoJ driver instance into the context object. So we said the context object is where we put things like database connections. If we have like a data abstraction layer or uh, some of the, some API, we can put those in the context object. And then that context object here is available inside each resolver. So when we're implementing resolver functions inside the uh, context object, we can find the connection to our database. Uh, and then we start up Apollo server and start it listening for incoming requests. So let's see if this works. Uh, it should. This is where we left off last time. So localhost 4000. We go there. Localhost 4000. We see GraphQL Playground. Zoom in a bit. We can look at the docs. So business search. We get back business. Okay. This tells us how we can traverse through our data graph using GraphQL queries. Great. So let's uh, do a business search uh, and the search string, we'll just leave blank, which should give us all businesses that should return us. Yep, here's all the businesses we have and we can traverse to the categories for each business. Yep, cool. So here's all the businesses we have in the data set and all of the categories. McCool says, hi guys. Hi, thanks for joining. Where are you dialing in from today? Okay, so what we wanna do now is, well, let's look at some of the, some of the problems here, some issues that we saw. Well, one is this idea of making multiple requests to the database for each GraphQL request. So here, we're searching for all of the businesses, give me the name of the business, but then also give me the categories of each business. So in this case, we get back the public library, but then we wanna know, okay, what are the categories for the library? Well. 
the way we've implemented our resolvers here, that means we have to call the categories resolver on the business type. So this is going to be another request to the database. We've got another business, Ninja Mikes. OK, what categories uh, are connected to Ninja Mikes? That's another request to the database. So we're making an additional request to the database for each one of these businesses. Uh, we have, what, I don't know, like 12 here. So that means we're making 13 round trip requests to the database just to render this pretty simple GraphQL request. Um, you can imagine as these get more complicated and as we're returning more results, we can start to really have performance problems. I mean, we, we're not seeing it here because this is just connecting to a database locally and, and these queries are pretty simple. But imagine if we had to make a network request from our API server to our database for each one of these queries that that time is gonna to start to add up. So this is known as the n plus one query problem where we want to avoid making multiple round trips to the database with each request. It would be much nicer if instead, uh, if instead that we could generate a single database query for each of our GraphQL requests. Um, so that's, that's one problem here with this sort of naive approach. The other problem, or I should say another problem that we notice is there's a lot of kind of boring boilerplate code that I have to write here. So I have to write the cipher query that's, you know, just sort of a fairly straightforward Cypher query traversal, when, once we figure out Cypher, there's um, you know, just sort of a standard here of, hey, here's uh, a search for a business, find the categories, uh, and so on. And then we kind of have to massage the results here. Um, you know, a lot of boilerplate. So that's not really fun to write. Uh, it would be nice if we could just abstract away that boilerplate code and instead just worry about you know, the interesting things, the custom logic that we want to add to our application, uh, basically the, the place that we have a specific value that we're interested in in our application, things that we want to add, rather than just a lot of this standard boilerplate stuff. So those are two big problems that I see with our, um, with our sort of naive implementation uh, that we've done so far. So in the book, we're going to learn how to address uh, some of these problems, how to address that n plus one problem, how to avoid writing all of this boilerplate data fetching logic in our GraphQL API. Uh, and we're going to do that by using the Neo4j GraphQL integration. So let's jump to chapter four in the book. And again, if you if you haven't downloaded it, uh, I pasted a link in the chat. I'll do it again uh, for anyone who's joined just now. Uh, and again, you can download this version of the ebook for free. Uh, just go to that URL and you can download the PDF that we are working through. Cool. So in chapter four, we introduced this concept of the Neo4j GraphQL integrations. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit so that's easier to read. Uh, and there are a few implementations of the Neo4j GraphQL integrations. There's Neo4j GraphQL JS, which is what we're going to use today. Uh, and then there's uh, a Java version for the JVM uh, and also a database plugin. But we're interested in working with Apollo Server and the Node.js ecosystem today. So we're looking at Neo4j GraphQL JS. So what is Neo4j GraphQL JS? Well, it's this library that we use uh, alongside any Node.js GraphQL implementation. So like Apollo Server, uh, or yoga, or uh, we can use it just with the bare GraphQL JS 
uh, reference implementation. But basically, any any of the GraphQL implementations for JavaScript uh, for the Node ecosystem, where we're building a client that sits between, or we're building an API rather that sits between the client and the database, right? So that's that's a fundamentally important part of the NFJ GraphQL integrations. Is, is we're not really talking about making the database speak GraphQL and, and sending queries to the database. We still want to be able to build this API layer that sits between the client and the database where we can implement um, things like authorization uh, at the application level, uh, caching, these sorts of things. We don't necessarily want our client to be querying the database directly in most cases. Okay, and so we talked about uh, some of the, the things we want to overcome, uh, this idea of the n plus one problem and uh, poor performance, both in making multiple round trips to the database that introduce a lot of latency um, and also poorly performing queries. So we want to get past that. And then also this idea of boilerplate uh, so having to write a lot of boilerplate just to, to fetch some data, uh, we haven't even talked about creating data or doing the more complex things like filtering, uh, that sort of thing. So that's where the concept of database integrations in general uh, for GraphQL comes in. So there are a few database integrations for GraphQL out there that take care of things like generating database queries from arbitrary GraphQL requests or helping with uh, data modeling given uh, a database. Can we generate a GraphQL schema for it? Or can we use GraphQL type definitions to drive what the database data model should be? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we look at EFJ GraphQL JS specifically. So there's sort of two things, uh, two, two specific areas, I guess we can say, that NFJ GraphQL JS, and, and this is true of, of all of the, the NFJ GraphQL integrations, um, but there's two like main areas that we're focusing on here uh, in this library. One is the schema augmentation aspect. So as the developer, we write our type definitions, so something, something like this. Uh, and these can either be generated from an existing NFJ database, uh, or if we're starting a new project, we can write these in GraphQL uh, SDL and then use that to then drive the data model in the database. But however we define those type definitions, uh, then the schema augmentation process adds uh, query mutation types, so adds entry points to create, read, update, and delete data uh, based on the types that we've defined, but also adds arguments for things like filtering, ordering, pagination, uh, all of the relevant input types to our schema, and then also allows us to use any of the native database types, so things like the temporal date, date time, types uh, and also the spatial types that are available in Neo4j. So the point, uh, latitude, longitude, X, Y, Z, the 3D point type, uh, and then functions associated with that, like the distance function. Then the other area uh, of features in this library are uh, what we'll call GraphQL transpilation, where at query time, we take an arbitrary GraphQL request and transpile that to Cypher. So basically, we generate a single database query for any arbitrary GraphQL query, uh, GraphQL operation, really, either query or mutation. And this is really, really important because that takes care of the n plus one query problem. So instead of making multiple round trips to the database, we generate a single database query. Uh, so we have a big performance advantage there. Um, also, we can then let the Cypher execution engine generate the query plan. So because Cypher is a declarative query language, 
uh, the execution engine, the database is going to figure out what is the optimal series of database operations to execute that query. So that gives us a performance uh, improvement as well. Uh, and then that means we don't have to implement these resolver functions. So we don't have to write a lot of these sort of boring boilerplate data fetching queries. Uh, instead, all of that is generated for us. So we get a, a huge developer productivity boost here when we use libraries like this. Uh, okay, so I think next we take a look at how to use this library. Um, I'll skip through this because this is loading the, the data set that we've already loaded. Um, we look at how to install this. So we can use npm to install this library uh, and then taking a look at some code here. So this make augmented schema, this is an important function because this allows us to pass our GraphQL type definitions. Uh, so like these type definitions, we can pass those to make augmented schema and we get back this executable schema object. So without writing any resolvers, those are generated uh, and attached to this schema object, which we can then pass to Apollo server. Uh, so if we look at our example from last time, we don't need any of this code. We don't need these resolvers. Um, let's actually, let's go ahead and see if we can get this working. So I'm going to get rid of our resolvers. Just delete those. And let's see, we'll need to do an npm install. I know we don't need the dash dash save anymore, but uh, old habit, I guess. Uh, always have to add that. OK, so we'll install EFJ GraphQL JS. So then up here we can say make augmented schema require nfj graphql js and after our type definitions we can say schema equals make augmented schema pass in the type defs and then here in our, our call to Apollo server, well, we don't have resolvers anymore, so let's delete that. And instead of passing our type definitions to Apollo server, we're going to pass this schema object that we created here. So schema, this is now a GraphQL schema object, an executable GraphQL schema that has now had resolvers generated through this make augmented schema process and attached. And we can just serve that with Apollo server. UFJ GraphQL JS follows the convention that we will have a driver instance injected into the context. Uh, so we should be good there. Okay. So let's start node index.js. And let's refresh Playground to pick up our new type definitions. Now if we go to docs, we can see that we have a lot of things now generated in our API that we didn't before. So in addition to our current user and business search, actually, let's take those out of our type definitions since we actually have that functionality implemented for us. And let's restart here. There we go. So I have uh, entry points for searching for users, reviews, businesses, category. 
Uh, if I look at business, I have a business filter. So I have some filtering functionality that's generated. Uh, and then I have connections to reviews and categories uh, and so on. I also have mutations generated here for all create, update, and delete operations. So I can do something like this. Show me all of the businesses. And we can filter for name contains. So we can, we're seeing some of the generated filtering functionality that's available. So uh, let's say or the name contains library. Just show me all the libraries. Oh, and we get an error there. Something is not right there. It's okay. Okay. Let's see. I think we have a GraphQL version issue going on here. Let's take a look. for J, GraphQL JS, Apollo Server. 19. Let's try this. Let's delete our node modules. And package lock. Do another install. So the problem here is I think sometimes we end up with multiple versions of GraphQL installed, which we want to avoid. Uh, so let's specifically install GraphQL 14.7.0 is the version we want. modules and package lock and try that again. And let's do a new index JS. Restart. Let's try this again. Okay, so give me all the businesses uh, name and address. And what we're we doing, we're doing a filter where name contains library. There we go. Okay, so the problem there was we had multiple versions of GraphQL installed. I think just because of the, the order in which I was installing things, um, but here we're, we're explicitly saying the version of GraphQL that we want to include. Great. Okay, so that's some of the generated filtering functionality. Um, but I guess the, the takeaway here, the interesting thing here is we didn't have to write any resolvers and now we have data fetching uh, queries generated for us uh, and also the schema augmented that includes this ordering, filtering, uh, and pagination. So we can, uh, we can let's bring in all of the businesses again, and we can say like order by name descending. Uh, and we have pagination, so we can say, give me only the first two offset to give me the next two, and so on. Um, okay, cool. So those are some of the things that are generated for us. Uh, let's skip ahead in the chapter here a little bit. 
Uh, so we talk about configurations. So we can exclude certain types um, and so on. We can disable mutations. Uh, for example, if we just want to generate a read-only API, um, we then start taking a look at using some of the features here. So basic queries, took a look at that. I'll skip that section. Ordering and pagination, uh, we saw briefly. Uh, nested queries, cool. So previously, we were querying for businesses and categories, so something like this. So now show me categories and the name of the category. And if I run that, I get an error. So what's going on there? Well, the reason we can't uh, immediately go from business to category is that in order to build up the, the Cypher query uh, to do this traversal, we need a little bit more information. We need to know the relationship type. So in our property graph model that Neo4j uses, every relationship has a type and direction. Uh, and that's what we're missing here. So we need to include in our type definitions the type of the relationship to follow and the direction. And to do that, let's see, where is this included in the book? Da, da, da. Uh, ah, here, here we go. This section on the uh, at relation directive. So schema directives, which is what this is here, this at relation uh, directive, these are GraphQL's built-in extension mechanism. So schema directives allow us to say, hey, there should be some custom logic uh, that happens here in the GraphQL server. Uh, and the Neo4j GraphQL JS library in includes uh, a few schema directives. Actually, if we take a look at the documentation, uh, by the way, this is the documentation for Neo4j GraphQL integrations, uh, which I dropped there. But let's take a look. Specifically, I'm interested in all of the schema directives. Can we go search for that? There we go, GraphQL schema directives. So there's quite a few schema directives that are available. And they allow us to, uh, one, attach additional information to the schema. So in the case of the uh, at relation directive, it allows us to include the name and direction of the relationship. Uh, but then we can also do things like indicate which field should be the ID uh, if it's not clear, uh, which field should have an index created for it, um, the at Cypher directive for implementing custom logic, which we'll take a look at in a moment, uh, and then authorization directives uh, as well for implementing authorization uh, and some other features. Okay, so our type definitions then are missing the at relation schema directive. So in our model, we have a relationship called in category. So if we go back here to arrows, I guess we have it. Uh, we said that a business is connected to a category with this in category relationship. So we're going to say the name is in category and the direction um, is out in this case, because it's going out from the business into the category. So let's restart. And let's run our query again. And cool, this time we get categories. 
So now we're able to generate that Cypher query to fetch the business and the categories. And now if I go onto the category type and if I add the at relation directive, so name in category direction and direction this time is in. And if we restart our server, and if I now add, so I traverse from the business to the category, and then I can traverse out from those categories to see, okay, what are other businesses in this category? Now that will be added to the query as well. Um, oh, it's kind of boring for these ones because there's only one business in the category graph database and only one in the category library. So let's pull those out since that's kind of boring and look at it for all of them. So here's uh, breakfast. We have a couple of breakfast restaurants um, and so on. And now I, I can add up reviews and for the review, I can get the text and the rating. So building up more complex uh, traversals. Oh, right, so reviews, we need to do the same thing for reviews. So business to reviews uh, at relation, the name is, I think we said reviews. So a review, reviews a business and the direction in this case is in because it's going from the, oh no, uh, yeah, in because it's going from the review to the business. And, uh, da -da. oh, and we need to do the same do, do, do for rating. Uh, what happened there? So, doesn't like that we don't have a value for rating because every Every rating should have a value. Let's look in the database and see what's going on there. So if we look at reviews, oh, it's called stars. So stars and it's a float. So instead of rating, this should be stars. And this should be a float. And then if we restart now, and run this again in Playground. Uh, can't query field rating on type review. Right, because we changed it to stars. Cool, now we get all of the categories for our businesses, all the other businesses in that category and all of the reviews. Uh, cool, question from the chat. Sorry, I just joined. Thanks for joining. Uh, what library do you use for connecting Apollo and Neo4j? We are using the Neo4j GraphQL JS library, uh, which I will drop a link to in the chat uh, right here. Um, okay. Oh, let's talk about debug mode. So we said we're generating these queries. Um, you said we're generating these queries, but what queries are we generating? So let's run, uh, let's, let's switch to a more simple query. So just businesses and names. that how we enable debug mode? <laughs> so what I want to do is enable debug mode. Debug config. Um, 
Oops, what did we do? Debug. Log it. Um, oh, capital. Uh, so we set a environment variable. Debug. We set that environment variable and then start our library, execute a query. Ah, there we go. Then we have now enabled debug mode. So set the uh, environment variable debug. And now when we start our GraphQL server, debug mode will log the generated Cypher query as well as the any parameters um, that are passed along with this query to the database as well. So in this case, our GraphQL query is saying just find uh, all businesses and give me the name of the business. Uh, and so you can see that's the database query that we send here, but we can do things like say, okay, only show me the first business. And now we can see, uh, okay, well now we've added a limit uh, and we passed first. So limit first one. And as we start to add up more complex traversal, so now find the categories, now we can see the generated queries get a bit more complicated. So now we're saying traverse from the business to the category. And then because with GraphQL, we're, we only ret want to return the fields that are requested in the selection set. So our Cypher query projects those out and says only return, in this case, the name field on categories. And this is cool because as we build up our more complex selection sets, we can see our queries uh, getting more complex to handle that information uh, as well. So we don't have to write those by hand. Uh, instead, this library takes care of generating those for us, which is really nice. Um, okay, cool. So back to the book. Uh, so we talked about basic queries, ordering, uh, we looked at nested queries, uh, filtering. We saw a little bit earlier how to do filtering. So we have this generated filter argument. We can even do nested filters, uh, which is pretty neat. Uh, so let's copy this query. Rectify that. Uh, let's bring this down. So there we go. So we can read that. So what this query is saying is find businesses uh, and then filter where the name contains brew. So like a brewery or a coffee shop, I guess. And then filter where it has a review where the stars is greater than or equal to 4.75. So show me a business that has a review, at least one, because it's reviews some, that has a rating of 4.75 or greater. And it shows me Zootown Brew and Kettle House. Uh, these filters are really nice. We can build up um, ands and ors. So lots of more complex filtering there as well. Uh, and we can filter at different levels in the selection set. So here, with this nested filter, because we're saying uh, filter on the reviews field, that's then applying that to the business. So find where the reviews uh, stars is 4.75, but uh, apply that filter to the business level. If we include filters further down in the selection set, so here we're filtering uh, at the reviews field. So we're still gonna get all of the businesses, oh, uh, 
copy, bad copy paste. Okay, so now we're getting all of the breakfast and coffee businesses, but only the reviews that we're gonna show are relevant to breakfast sandwich. And it turns out there's only one. So this, fil this filter is not applied to the parent selection. It's not applied to the business. This filter, because we specified it nested in the selection set, only applies to the reviews that are returned. So notice we do return market on front and Zutan Brew, but they don't have any business because they are coffee or breakfast businesses, but they don't have any reviews that mention breakfast sandwich. So in, this, in our application, this is a good way to know like, oh, okay, cool. If I want a breakfast sandwich, I'm going to go to Ninja Mike's, not to these other two. Uh, okay, so lo lots of cool things we can do there with filters. We can also work with the, the temporal fields. Um, so working with date time, uh, let's skip that section. We can also work with spatial data. So point types, uh, distance filters. So find things that are near to me, uh, find things within, in this example, this is what looking for things, uh, 1.5 kilometers from the New York J office. So I wanna find a place to go to lunch. I can use this sort of logic. Okay, let's skip to adding custom logic because I, I think this is a really important feature to talk about. So, so far, what we've seen in our API have been just the generated features. So generated filters, the, the generated uh, CRUD operations for the create, read, update, delete. We haven't talked about mutations, but we saw that they're there. We saw that we can create and update data uh, as well without writing any resolvers. But what if we have some custom logic that we want to implement? Uh, what if we want to recommend businesses based on uh, some logic, uh, something like that? Uh, well, there's a few ways that we can implement custom logic using NewFJ GraphQL JS and the NewFJ GraphQL integrations. The first is with the Cypher directive. So I mentioned uh, this idea of schema directives before, and, and we had to add some schema directives to our schema to specify the type and direction of our relationships. The Cypher directive allows us to attach a Cypher query to a field. So here we're going to add an average stars field. Uh, this is going to be uh, a float. And we're going to add a cipher statement here. That says um, match this. So this is a special keyword in these cipher statements that we use in the cipher directive that refers to the currently resolved object. So when we're resolving a business, this here, this refers to the business that we're currently resolving. Uh, and what I want to do is compute the average stars. So for all the reviews connected to this business, what is the average of the stars field of those reviews? So we'll traverse the review and we'll return average r dot stars. So we'll save that. And restart our server. And now we can say business, give me name and average stars. And we get an error because it says unknown function, epoch cipher run first column. So uh, one thing, this is, this is mentioned in the book, but we skipped over it, but the NFJ GraphQL JS library depends on the APOC standard library for Neo4j. Um, so you can install this in NFJ desktop just by uh, going to the manage and then the plugins section um, and clicking install. 
if you're using any of the cloud Neo4j services like Neo4j Aura or Sandbox, then APOC is installed by default because it's uh, it's the standard library. And actually in future versions of Neo4j, APOC is installed by default. Uh, so if you see that error, that just means that you haven't installed the APOC standard library yet. Let's try that again. And now we get back this average stars field along with all of our business names. So if we look at the generated query for that one, we can see that here, here's the query that we added in the schema with that Cypher schema directive. We can see that's attached as kind of a subquery. So even though we're adding custom Cypher queries, basically we're adding computed fields in our GraphQL schema, even though we're adding those, we can still generate a single Cypher query to send as a single round trip request to the database. Um, so that's pretty neat um, because it allows us to define custom logic using the power of Cypher, um, but still take advantage of the n plus one, uh, take advantage of the lack of the n plus one query problem, I guess. So generate a single database query, let the Cypher execution engine figure out uh, how to optimize it. Uh, so that's still gonna be, be really, really fast. And it gives us the flexibility now of using Cypher to add our custom logic. So I think this is a, a really cool feature. I think it's a really good balance of having all of this generated functionality for us uh, as part of this schema augmentation process, not having to implement any resolvers, but then still having the, the ability to implement custom logic using the Cypher directive when we want to add custom logic. So that's really neat. We can also use these Cypher directive fields for root uh, query and mutation fields. So if we have a uh, custom mutation that we want to define in Cypher, we can do that. If we have a uh, custom query type and we want to use a, a full text index or, or something like that, uh, or sort of more complicated initial matching for finding uh, the initial uh, set of nodes to traverse from, we can do that with Cypher as well. So really powerful. Uh, we can also implement resolvers manually. So if we can't express in Cypher the custom functionality that we want, we can just implement a resolver function uh, and attach that to the schema. So here uh, we implement a, a fake wait time function uh, for a business, which is just a random number. But you can imagine here maybe we call out to some other service that has information about the wait time for the restaurants, um, something like that. So uh, in general, I, I think the goal with UFJ GraphQL has been to implement uh, a balance between generated functionality, but also have it be as uh, extensible as possible for adding custom logic. So um, I think in, in my mind, I think Cypher the at Cypher directive is really my favorite and most powerful feature. Uh, okay, then we have a section that talks about inferring a GraphQL schema from an existing database. So in this example, we wrote these GraphQL type definitions by hand because we were starting from business requirements for our application. Uh, we we drew out a data model and then translated that data model diagram to type definitions. But what if we have an existing database? It would be nice if we can just generate the type definitions from the existing database. Uh, and it turns out we can do that. There is a infer schema export in Neo4j GraphQL JS that we just create a driver instance uh, and point infer schema at that database and it will generate GraphQL type definitions for us. Um, so for example, we could save those to a file and then pass them to the make augmented schema 
process to create a new GraphQL API for us. So we certainly can basically start from an existing NFJ database and get a GraphQL API with full CRUD operations on top of that database without really writing much code other than uh, generating the schema using this infer schema function. So that is really powerful as well. Okay, cool. Let's um, let's take a look at the exercises and see if we can complete these based on uh, a skimming of the book so far. Uh, I, I think we'll be able to get through it. Okay, so number one, query the GraphQL API we created in this chapter using GraphQL Playgrounds, okay, to find, first off, which users have reviewed the business named Hanabi? Okay, so we want to do a filter where the business name Oops, where the business name contains, let's, let's make this a little bigger, give a little, give ourselves a little room here, where the name contains Hanabi. Okay, cool. So there's a business name Hanabi. It has average stars of five uh, because it is the best ramen restaurant uh, in Burlingame. If you're familiar with that area, the Hanabi is just a little walk down from the NFJ office uh, in the Bay Area. Anyway, we want to know what users have reviewed this business. Okay, cool. So we can say reviews because a business is connected to a review. So we want to go from the business to the review. And then from the review, we want to go to the user and get the name. And I think we need to add another relation directive from the review to the user. Yes, we're missing that. So relation, name, what did we say, writes? A user writes a review, is that what we said? Yeah, user writes review. So the direction in this case is going to be coming in because this is a field on the review type. So it's coming in from the user to the review. So the direction is in. Is that the only one that we need? Business to review, review to user, I think so. Let's restart that, try again. Uh, Review.user. Non nullable fields. I didn't like that. Um, why not? Ah, so we didn't we didn't actually use we didn't use this model exactly in the database. We have a slightly different model. Uh, it says user wrote the review. Not writes. Wrote. Okay, restart that. There we go. Okay, so. Which users have reviewed the business named Hanabi? Uh, just our user, Jenny. And she must have given it five stars. Does it have a five star? Yep, let's give it five stars. Didn't write a text description for the review. OK, cool. Find any reviews that contain the word comfortable. What businesses are they reviewing? Well, we can start here at the review, do a filter. Now where the text of the review contains 
the word comfortable. And we can return the stars and text of the review. Um, and then I want to know what uh, stars text. So I want to go from the review to the business. I want to see the name of the business, but I don't have that in the schema. But we can add that. So go from a review to a business. And every review should be connected to a business. So we can make that a non-nullable business object. And we need to add our relation directive. So the name of the relationship is reviews. So we review, reviews a business. So the direction is going to be out because it's going from the review out to the business. And let's restart our server. And if I, now I have the business field. So I can say business name. And I can see that this review is about the public library. So not many comfortable places to sit and read at the library. OK, cool. Next one, which users have given no five-star reviews? Ooh, this will be a good one. So. User, let's say, we'll bring back the name, and let's bring back the reviews uh, and the stars. So here's all of the users uh, and all of their reviews. Are we missing a relation directive? Yes, we're missing one here. Uh, so user, what do we say, wrote a review, so the direction User wrote review, direction is going to be out. Restart the server. Okay, cool. So here's all the users and the reviews that they've written. Um, because this is such a small data set, we can, we can look at this and we can see, um, okay, only Bob has not written a five-star review. So, we, okay, that's the answer we want to get. But how do we write a GraphQL query to find that? Well, we saw this nested filtering that we could do here. So, for example, here we're searching for businesses that had a, at least one review of 4.75. So I think I think this sort of syntax is what we want to use. Uh, if we go digging in the documentation, filtering with GraphQL uh, and the nested filter, I think we can also look at all of the filtering that's generated um, in this table. That will tell us as well. Uh, we also have, we can also try this in the documentation. We have these graphical components embedded to experiment with that, uh, which is quite nice. But let's go back to Playground. So user, we want to filter here. So I mean, I can, I can apply a filter here that says only filter where stars um, let's say greater than right so only show me the five star reviews is kind of kind of what we're getting at but that's that's not quite what I want because I don't want to apply the filter at the reviews level I want to pl apply it at at the root at the user level. So I know I, I want the filter up here. And I know I want it to apply to 
reviews. Uh, and I want to filter where there are, there are no. So I think I want reviews none where stars is greater than or equal to 5.0. Let's try that. And it gives me Bob. Yeah, cool. So this is a good one. This, this I think shows the power of these nested filters um, because I, I could apply this deeper down in the selection set as well, right? I could say, um, uh, even show me reviews where maybe like my friends or co-occurrences of reviews, uh, that sort of thing. Question from the chat. Do we do these streams often? Yeah. So, um, I do this stream every Thursday at 3 PM Pacific. Um, if you look in the Twitch calendar. I won't. I won't open up Twitch now, or I'll. I'll see like a <laughs> a mirror uh, of myself. But if you look at the Twitch calendar, you can see some of the other folks at Near for J that do streams. I think uh, Lou does one on Mondays, and Adam does one uh, as well on different topics. Mine are mine are usually focused around using GraphQL in Near for J, but uh, Lou and Adam switch around on, on different things as well. I think Adam has been working on building React applications with TypeScript and Neo4j. Uh, and Lou's been uh, digging deep into a, a wine data set, showing how we can do some analytics there. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, Florent, I think, has recently started streaming as well. He's been doing a series on Go. So yeah, so anyway, um, there's quite a few streams, I think, on the, the Neo4j channel. You can also watch on YouTube on the Neo4j YouTube channel. Uh, and all the recordings end up on YouTube as well. Cool. So, um, yeah, so there's a question, can we get the latest review. And we could if we if we captured that, do we have, I don't think we actually have the time of the review. A review just has stars and text. So if we had the timestamp that the review was created, we could then say here, order by uh, like created descending or something like that. Um, so because we don't have that data in the database, uh, I mean, we can order by like stars descending. Let me take out the filter so we can verify that's what's going on. But yeah, the, the generated filter functionality, uh, or I'm sorry, the generated ordering functionality uh, basically allows us to order results by any, any field. Uday says, can I create a GraphQL directive to add filters instead of me typing it? I'm lazy as it comes. Um, A GraphQL directive to add filters. Do you mean a, a client directive or do you mean like add something in the schema that always gets applied? Let me know and um, when I see your answer, we'll, we'll take a look at that. But I'm gonna move on to the next question here which is add a cipher directive field to the category type that computes the number of businesses in each category. How many businesses are in the coffee category? Yeah, so this is gonna be kind of similar to, uh, similar to this, uh, where'd it go? To our average stars, right? So we're gonna add 
a Cypher directive field, let's put it at the end, to category. Um, does it say what we're supposed to call it? Uh, it computes the number of businesses. Now let's just say num business businesses. I think I spelled that correctly. Uh, this is going to be an integer. So add Cypher, takes a statement. And we're going to say match uh, this business in category. So if you look at our data model, businesses are connected to category with this in category relationship. So I wanna, this is the pattern I want to look for. B business. Uh, and then I want to return the count of the business. And I can alias it to whatever. It doesn't really matter. And let's restart. Uh, and what was the question? How many businesses are in the coffee category? So let's category. Um, so I saw we could do the filters, and we can also just specify an argument if we want to do an exact match. So if, we're do, if we want to just do an exact match, we can just use the name argument instead of the filter argument. Uh, and I want number of businesses. It says there's two. If we go back to our generated query, so here's the query that gets generated. And again, we can see here's the Cypher query that we wrote in the Cypher schema directive that gets included as a subquery. Cool. Next one. Um, oh, Uday says in the schema. So, can I create a GraphQL directive to add filters instead of typing it in the schema? So, you want to add something in the schema so that on temporal types, search by ascending date by default. That is a good question. Um, in the schema. Well, I guess you could implement, you could implement, you, you, you could implement your own directive um, to do that. I, I guess that, that's kind of similar it reminds me uh, of the approach that uh, Ian took when he built the GraphQL auth, um, what did he call that, uh, deep auth. Let's see if we can find that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here it is. So uh, Ian Cleats wrote a package called Neopty GraphQL Deep Auth. I'll drop a link to this in the chat. And what this does is it it implements a directive called Deep Auth that takes a path where really what the path is. Uh, are filter arguments to add to the generated query. His use case here for doing this was adding more complex authorization rules. So if you want to uh, say like, okay, a, a user can only see himself and uh, users that he is friends with, you can specify this in the schema as an argument to this deep auth directive. And then at query time, these filters will be added to the GraphQL query, which will then get added to the generated Cypher query. So Uday, for your question about a directive that's adding filters or ordering, uh, I think this is kind of how you would do it. If you take a look at uh, how Ian implemented the, not sure where this lives. 
Um, is there a directive visitor here? Um, not sure. If you take a look at Ian's code, though, we'll give you um, give you an idea of how he implemented that directive. Because the same sort of same sort of idea here, where you you just want to specify filters or ordering arguments in any arguments really that you want to just be added to the Cypher query uh, and the GraphQL query um, by default. Cool, yeah, so I dig into that. Um, but anyway, but to answer your question, like nothing nothing out of the box, uh, but you, you can definitely uh, implement something that does that. Okie doke, last question. Create a Neo4j sandbox instance at sandbox.neo4j.com. Let's drop that in the chat. Great resource, that sandbox. Uh, choosing from any of the pre-populated data sets. Well, let's go do that. Uh, Neo4j.com slash sandbox. So sandbox, the Neo4j sandbox, I should say, lets us spin up Neo4j instances that are private to us, but are hosted in the cloud with existing uh, data loaded in them. Uh, so we can choose from any of these. There, there's lots of different kinds, or there's lots of different use cases, uh, different data sets here. You can even pull in your own Twitter data if you connect with your Twitter account. It will sort of crawl your, your Twitter uh, follower network and, and tweets and stuff. Uh, well, uh, let's do Legisgraph. I haven't looked at this one in a long time. This, this, this is a bit outdated now, because um, I don't think we update this regularly. But this is a data set of US Congress and like the bills and the bills that they voted on, the committees they serve on, and so on. So we just had an election in the US. So sure, why not? Let's, let's look at some congressional data. Um, okay, what was the question? Uh, create a sandbox instance choosing any of the pre-populated data sets using infer schema from Neo4j GraphQL JS, create a GraphQL API for this Neo4j sandbox instance without manually writing GraphQL type definitions. What data can you query using GraphQL? Okay, cool, this is a good one. So, so here's the case where we have an existing Neo4j database and we want to generate a GraphQL API for it. We want to use the infer schema functionality. Let's look at that in the documentation. There's a guide, infer GraphQL schema. That tells us how to do that. So, We create a driver instance that connects to the database. We run this infer schema function, uh, and then we get back type definitions, and then we pass those to make augmented schema, which is then going to generate our GraphQL API. Um, okay. That is how we do it. Looks like our sandbox instance is still firing up here. What's going on there? OK, it was running. So let's open up Neo4j browser and um, see what we're working with here. going on. <laughs> Something is a little off with our sandbox instance. Let's try connecting directly to the HTTP port. So not sure what the problem is there, but if we connect directly, no, it doesn't look that. 
Hmm. All right, let's let's try this again. Let's terminate this one. Start a new project. Let's just graph. Let's project. So the sandbox is uh, behind the scenes is really quite neat. This is a a project that my team built and, and maintains. And what's going on here? There's a uh, all these run on uh, AWS in a uh, Elastic Container Services cluster. Uh, so each time that you spin up one of these, it's spinning up a container that is private to you. Uh, so that's why you have to log in to Sandbox is because all of these are private to a single user. So if you see the connection details, this is private just for your instance. OK, cool. So that worked. I don't know what the problem was there. But now we've got some data. So if we do DB schema visualization, we can see, let's make this a little bigger. We can see that we have legislators that are elected to a, a congressional body. So this can either be the, the Senate or the House. They represent a state. They're a member of a political party. Uh, they serve on a committee. And they sponsor and vote on bills. Bills go to committees. Bills deal with the subject and are proposed during a congressional session. Cool. So this is Legisgraph. This is a fun project that um, actually I think this was a, f a friend George and I did this uh, several years ago. Uh, it's just kind of a fun project. I think we built it for a, a meetup demo or something like that. Um, this is a fun one. So anyway, what we want to do is build a GraphQL API so we can query this. Uh, and we want to use this infer schema functionality to do that. Well, I'm going to cheat a little bit because I wrote this integration for Sandbox a while ago that you may not know is out there, but it's pretty neat. So if we go to connect via drivers, this will show us uh, some code snippets for how we can use various drivers for Neo4j to connect to the Sandbox instance and run a query. Uh, we also have the GraphQL tab, which shows us how to connect to the database, infer the schema, uh, and start a GraphQL API using makeup and its schema. So we basically just create a driver instance run infer schema, and then pass that to make augmented schema and serve our schema through Apollo server. We can also click this deploy to code sandbox button. Um, so code sandbox, if you haven't seen this before, code sandbox allows us to run JavaScript code um, either for the, the browser or server side code. In the case of server side code, it, it's runs in a container somewhere that, that Code Sandbox hosts for us. And this is kind of neat because what it what it does first is it first runs infer schema. So first it runs this infer. Uh, let's make this a bit bigger. There we go. First it runs infer.js, which uh, runs in first schema, and then it rewrites uh, this file, this schema.graphql file. So now this is this is run. So now schema.graphql, these are the generated type definitions from that sandbox instance. And then it runs index.js, which reads those type definitions from the file system and passes those to make augmented schema. Uh, so this 
this sandbox button is a really cool way to get a GraphQL API on top of any of the sandbox instances, um, sort of for free. Yep, says he needs to go to sleep. Yeah, I hope to see you again. Yeah, well, thanks for joining. Uh, we'll catch you next week, or uh, you can catch the recordings on uh, the YouTube channel. So let's copy this URL so we don't have the code sandbox Chrome around that and see what we can query. So we've got some entry points. Um, let's take a look at uh, one specific state. So a state has have a name, does have a name, it has a code. I think this is a two digit code. Let's look at California. And all of the legislators for California. So we've got Kamala Harris, who that's now vice president elect. But at this time, so I think this is pulling in from the um, at least five, maybe six years ago. Uh, so this is a bit outdated. But if we pull in that represents member of elected to elected to is connected to body. So that's what we want. And then body has a type. So this should show us, yep, that Kamala Harris is elected to the Senate for California. Uh, and other members in the House and so on. Um, so we can also traverse to see uh, maybe bills that they voted on. So let's let's look at just the first three bills for each legislator uh, to see the title and okay, do we see how they voted? And vetoed, enacted, bill, active. Deals with. Oh, deals with. We can look at the categories of each bill. So Karen Bass voted. Oh, actually, I think I know what's going on. So there's two. There's two types of voted here. There's voted on rel, which has the vote and then the bill and the official title. So this is an interesting quirk of the generated schema. So if we go back to the code sandbox and look at schema.graphql. So Infer schema is useful often as maybe like a starting point, but it, it's not always going to be maybe the, the ending version of the schema that we want to work with. Because if we see here, we have the type voted on. Uh, and then we also have voted on connecting a legislator to a bill. So we have voted on as this relationship field and then voted on rel, which gives me a list of voted on types. So what's the difference between the type voted on and this relationship field here voted on? Well, in the case where we have relationships that have properties. So in the property graph model, uh, let's go back here, um, look at reviews. This could be maybe a date time on the reviews relationship. So here, 
we're storing a property on the relationship. Uh, it's called create, it's a date timestamp. But how do we then model that in GraphQL? Well, what we do is we then promote reviews to its own type that then has a from and a to field and the properties of the relationship modeled as a type. And that's what we've done here um, in our inferred schema. So I think our inferred schema process says, hey, well, some of these voted on relationships have a vote, uh, which is like either yay or nay or whatever. Uh, but then some of them don't have a vote. So in the case where they have a vote property, then we promote that to its own type voted on so that you can query the properties of that relationship. There's, there's a bit more in the documentation about this um, in the, let's see, relationship types, relationship with properties. So in here, and I think also in the GraphQL schema design guide, I think also has some information about that. Cool, so if we go back to our query, uh, was it here? Now we can see uh, some additional votes. So here, Karen Bass voted no on this bill, whatever it is, to amend Title 28 to improve fairness and class litigation, class action litigation, and so on. Cool. So anyway, the, the point of that exercise was just to, to show us how to use infer schema uh, functionality. Uh, and that's available, that button's available on all of the sandbox instances. Uh, and you can you can also edit these code sandbox things. So you can uh, you can then fork these. And let's say I wanted to add a field that's like, I don't know, most common topics or something. Uh, and this was going to be a list of subjects. I could then write uh, a cipher directive field that then has the logic of whatever it is for matching from the legislator to find what the most common bills that they've sponsored and uh, that sort of thing. Cool, so that gets us through the exercises. Um, so that finishes up chapter four. Uh, so we will uh, call it good for the day. Um, again, let me post a link to download the free three chapter excerpt of the book uh, that we've been following along. Drop that link in the chat here. Anyone can download that for free. If you wanna follow along, uh, you can find the recordings for the previous uh, streams that we've done on the NFJ YouTube channel. Uh, I do this stream every Thursday at 3 p.m. Pacific. Uh, next week, so this is, this is I think the last one of the book club session uh, of the free book. Maybe we'll pick up uh, some of the chapters that are in the full version of the book. Uh, since we only covered less than half of what's in the book, the full version of the book, but uh, we won't, we'll take a bit of a break from that. So I think next week we'll start something new. Um, not quite sure what that'll be. Have some, have some ideas, but uh, tune in and we'll do something fun at least. So thanks for joining today and hope to see you next Thursday at 3 p.m. Pacific for the next stream working with uh, GraphQL and Neo4j. So thanks for joining. Uh, goodbye.